I have the privilege of introducing our next speaker. Uh, this is Dr. Adnan Siddiqui, uh, whom I went to in Buffalo, and I'm very grateful to him for all the support that I got from him and all the training and that he's here for us today. Uh, so Dr. Adnan Siddiqui is professor and vice chairman, director, neurovascular uh, fellowship and research, department of neurosurgery. He's also director of Toshiba Stroke and Vascular Research Center at University of Buffalo. And uh, so over to you, Dr. Adnan. Asim Saab, shukriya aapka, bahut bahut. Um, so my job is to talk about mechanical thrombectomy tips and tricks. Um, but given the fact that we had some of these discussions uh, in the last session, I'm going to borrow again, just uh, like Ansar did, to show the acute need in the place. Um, uh, something that I uh, led in the United States. Uh, so uh, it, it was my privilege to write the, the guidelines for all neuroendovascular training in the United States, which have subsequently become law uh, through adoption through all the professional societies for neurosurgery, radiology, neurology, and the American Board of Medical Specialties. Um, and these are now published and they're widely available, and they have been well respected by all sorts of experts. And this is uh, a title of a talk that I gave at the World Federation of Interventional Neuroradiology and the Society for Neurointerventional Surgery early this year, where I think there is a need for a specific training program for fellowship in acute ischemic stroke intervention. And I believe this is uh, a subspecialty that Omar talked about a little bit earlier as well, that needs to have expertise in both pharmacologic and minimally invasive catheter-based technology, radiological imaging, and clinical expertise to diagnose and treat acute ischemic stroke. Um, and this, because of the unique clinical and invasive nature, requires special training and skills. Um, I believe the places which are providing this training, at least initially, should be part of a comprehensive interventional stroke program, uh, both hemorrhagic and ischemic, because you, when you, while you're learning ischemic, one of the problems you can have during ischemic treatment is a hemorrhagic complication, and you need to be able to manage that aspect. And so the initial aspect of these trainings should be in the same training programs as the ones that do everything. I think the prerequisite should be somebody uh, who has expertise in diagnostic cerebral angiograms, and also there's prerequisite of supraaortic stenting. So they need to have expertise in getting above the aorta. And then as far as the curriculum is concerned, these specialists can come from any interventional field, neurosurgery, neurology, radiology, cardiology, surgery, and by surgery I primarily mean vascular surgery. So there should be no restriction the only requirement is somebody who's has got expertise in angiography and supraaortic access. Then what is the fellowship? I think the fellowship requires the dedicated 12 continuous months during which the training the, can experience interventions as well as get expertise in the clinical care of these patients and the pharmacologic and endovascular therapies for all types of atherosclerotic or ischemic disease. And this should require a variety of things which are standard for neuroendovascular, understand anatomy, understand physiology, understand pharmacologic agents. I think we should stop talking in the back so that we have a little bit of quiet. Um, and then the technical aspects of acute ischemic stroke intervention which is understanding how to get to the brain, how to get in, how to get out, as well as administration of intravenous thrombolytic therapy. And then the fellowship is not just a procedure, it's peri-procedural follow-up, patient evaluation, decision-making, neurointensive care, and long-term follow-up, things that Ansar and I and everybody sitting on this stage does every single day. So the core competency is at least 100 interventional procedures as primary operator, and the core competency of what will constitute this fellowship is at least 25 extracranial stents, 30 acute ischemic strokes, 10 intracranial infusions for vasospasm, for stroke, 
And if the, pay, the, the physician is unable to do it, the fellowship should be extended. And the clinical practice. So what happens when the person comes back to his clinical practice? It is extremely important that these new neurocardiologists, these new physicians, should establish experiential networks of neuroendovascular experts who can continue to provide support and feedback on, a, on an ongoing basis. Like Asim reaches out to Ansar, I think that is an example of continuing that dialogue. The culture of multidisciplinary care of neurological patients with support from both neurology and neurosurgery because there will always be other diagnoses that will be discovered when you're taking care of these stroke patients. And finally, very important, critical collection and sharing of procedural and outcomes data to support continued practice. So I think this is just something that is something uh, which is being seen by the radiology societies of North America and Europe, and there's a lot of ongoing dialogue, but this is, I think, something that we can all stand behind. Okay, so now coming to mechanical thrombectomy, they primarily fall into three different categories. Um, there is stent retrievers, um, then there is aspiration, and then there are combination approaches. So let's just go through some of that. Um, aspiration, also called ADAPT, primarily means you're going to go up there with a large bore tube and you're going to suck the clot out because unlike coronary intervention where the lesion is almost always a ruptured plaque, in stroke, in most cases, even with high incidence of intracranial athro, 70, 80, and in the US, 90% of cases, it's an embolus, it's not a thrombus. It's an embolus which has gone and lodged into a native normal blood vessel. Retrievable stent is basically deploying a stent across that thrombus and then dragging it back. And solumbra is a combination. You're aspirating as you're retrieving the stent. They're not mutually exclusive and there are other techniques as well that one can employ. The first thing with every procedure is starting with access. I think it's really important to have a balance between proximal support and distal navigability. And this is almost always the challenge that we deal with. The other concerns are flow arrest. So when you're pulling the clot back, because the clot is a heterogeneous sort of composition, it can embolize and go get lodged into other vessels. So having proximal flow arrest with the balloon guide is useful. But the problem with balloon guides is their inner diameter is smaller. So you've sort of balanced these issues out. So my standard recipe is a nine French femoral sheath and then a nine French balloon guide if the anatomy is relatively straightforward because these balloon guides can navigate tortuosity very well. If I cannot get distal because there is significant tortuosity, I switch out for a eight French guide or a six French long sheath instead. Then I always employ the largest aspiration catheter I can, and there are a variety of different companies that are making these six French aspiration catheters which keep getting better day by day by day. And then I usually have a micro catheter which I use to deliver my aspiration catheter up to the clot. And in cases where I cannot cross cannot bring the aspiration uh, catheter to the clot, I will then cross the clot and deploy a stent retriever, and there are a variety of stent retrievers available in the United States. I personally am unable to distinguish significant performance differences between the different stent retrievers. But the recipe is not written in stone. I think you need to always be successful. Try one thing. If it doesn't work, you try something else. And always remember the specifics. So here's an example of a case. It's a type three arch, it's severe tortuosity. There's, um, uh, looks like there's a basilar occlusion as well. What to do? Go take a radial. Radial is an excellent option. You can put in a long six French sheath without a, 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 a which, with a sheathless system. And then you can employ the largest aspiration catheters and you can, you can get up there. Here's another one with severe tortuosity of the proximal uh, common carotid on the left side. 
and despite multiple attempts, you can't get there because your guide catheter barely is in the distal common. Well, try to go ahead and get direct uh, access through the radial. Okay, well, we can go radial, but there's a tight loop in the radial in the arm. Well, do a direct carotid access. Directly go into the neck using ultrasound, take your six French sheath into the internal and bring your aspiration catheter, deploy the stent and pull it out and get excellent revascularization. So, so you really need to sort of consider what your approach is and I think looking at the CTA of the arch and neck is part number one. That is absolutely critical to planning a successful rapid procedure. Taking three hours to get a vessel open is not a good idea. There's a talk, a thought about there is a golden hour of intervention and more and more and more it looks like there's a golden half hour of intervention. So if your intervention goes significantly over a half hour, the likelihood of causing more harm during revascularization really significantly increases. So uh, I'll show you some uh, examples of uh, cases. Uh, aspiration catheter advanta uh, advantages you don't have to deploy a stent retriever, so you're saving money on the stent retriever. It's pretty quick, um, and uh, you can get rapid uh, aspiration recanalization. Problem is, getting these catheters to the clot is not necessarily that easy. Uh, so here's a, a case, and I'll show you, this is the right MCA thrombectomy. So there you can see there is an occlusion of the superior trunk. See this area is empty? And you can see fairly good collaterals coming down in a delayed phase. Um, again, looking at it, now what we do here is we have a long six French sheath, and we are going to go uh, up with the microcatheter all the way. There you can see the microcatheter climbing up into the MCA, up to the occlusion, because the occlusion is right around here. And now we are trying to get our aspiration catheter around. Look at how big this catheter is. It almost always gets stuck at this point. And when it's getting stuck, this microcatheter is getting pulled out. So you need to sort of be patient, keep the wire out there, and continue to sort of utilize getting the aspiration catheter and optimize your location. And once you have that in place, you pass the ophthalmic, you push this catheter, and then you push it beyond where the clot is. Because there's always a static column of blood just proximal to the thrombus. So you've got to push it so you can literally cork the clot. And once you have that, uh, I usually apply aspiration for 30 to 60 seconds and then pull the whole aspiration catheter out and you can have complete recanalization. Now, many times you cannot get that aspiration catheter up there. You have a tight siphon. This is a big catheter. It cannot make that turn. So what do you do? Well, in that case, you need to use a stent retriever to really be able to optimize uh, recanalization of one go. So what I like to use is use the wire in a J configuration because when you have the wire straight, it can go into things you can't see. So the problem with stroke is you can only see prior to the occlusion. You have no idea what kind of branch point this person has distal to the occlusion. So it's important to use a J wire so you can navigate the blood vessels and the J keeps the wire in the largest vessels and usually in the most straight vessels coming off the M1 or MC or ICA, which is typically where the clot will go as well. Um, and then once you have the catheter across, you always do a micro injection to make sure you're not in a very small vessel, that you are distal to the clot, and then deploy the stent retriever. And uh, so here's a case of that. We'll this is a right MCA using thrombectomy technique. So let's see, this is, you can see uh, there's a right carotid. There is our big guide. Uh, we again are in the same position. Look at the J wire going intracranially using the microcatheter. And I'm bringing my microcatheter all the way up. I'll usually at this point stop and try to get my aspiration catheter all the way to the face of the clot. And you will see that despite our attempt, uh, it, is, it is just not happening. We are stuck at the ophthalmic, so now we have crossed the thrombus, and now we're gonna take the microcatheter across, and there goes the microcatheter. Many times it'll get caught, right? We're doing this under roadmap. Again, this is do the microinjection to make sure you're in a large vessel, and then 
Once you have confirmed that, then you can bring a stent retriever up and deploy this uh, by unsheathing it through the microcatheter. And there you can see the, uh, the stent retriever is coming out. Uh, you're, you're taking the lax out and you're uh, sort of deploying the stent retriever. And what I like to do is when I deploy this, I take the microcatheter out completely. The advantage here you can see is the moment the stent retriever is deployed, you have established distal flow. There is flow which is going across. I typically give three minutes of revascularization prior to pulling it all out. So there you can see we pulled it out, and what we have done is we have converted an proximal M1 into a mid-M1. What do you do? You do it all over again. Our technologies are not perfect. Our first pass efficacy in the best of hands is 50 to 55%. That's the reality today. Our first pass of getting everything open is a rare thing. So again, you can see the stent is being deployed um, and we are unsheathing it just like we did before. There is, now once you deploy the stent to retrieve, usually aspiration catheter will go up. And again, what I'm trying to do here is nab the clot between the aspiration catheter and pull it down and looks like now we got everything opened. So, why did it not open first time? Why did it open second time? We don't understand that well because we don't know what we are pulling out. We don't know if it's a red cell rich clot, it's a fibrin rich clot, it's an atherosclerotic plaque. We don't know that yet, but you just try and you try again. I'll typically give up after my fifth or sixth attempt because I'm concerned I'm gonna rip the vessel open with all the trauma that you're exerting on these uh, vessels. Here are a couple other interesting concepts just to share with you that the, I promise you the way I'm doing stroke right now, I will not be doing it this way five years from now. I think technology continues to improve. And this is a novel concept of trying to improve aspiration by using the entire lumen of the guide catheter. And so this is a case uh, of a much older patient than you would consider possibly treating in, the uh, in, in Pakistan and looks like there is uh, an occlusion of the basilar, and again, you're using the J to cross into the PCA and doing a micro-injection to confirm that you are in a distal location, looks good, and then you deploy a stent retriever. It's not an unreasonable as a first attempt, and you deploy the stent retriever, use the same thing as we did before. Uh, we have a six French guide catheter here because six French guide catheter is usually uh, all that you can uh, put through these uh, vertebrals in most cases. And the problem with a six French guide down in the neck and, a, uh, and um, a stent retriever up there is by the time you drag this all the way down, there are lots of places you could lose the clot. So we are aspirating through the guide catheter, we are aspirating through uh, uh, as much as we possibly can, and let's see what happens with this. We do a run and we still have an occlusion. So we didn't really do much. So in this case, what do we do? I say, okay, we're gonna switch over. Instead of going femoral, we switch to a radial six French sheath less to be, allow, to be able to put the largest aspiration catheters up. So you can see we, are, we have a six French long sheath and through that, I'm putting an aspiration catheter into and now we are going to try to use this sort of MIVI device, and I'll, you will see that in a second. It's a rapid exchange type aspiration catheter, something you guys are very used to. You sort of backload the microcatheter over it, as you can see me doing here. Yes, okay. And so you, now you're applying the asp. Oh, I didn't hear the bell. Okay, okay, all right. So there, we are going with the aspiration catheter. And here we go uh, with apply aspiration directly, and there is a TIKI-3 recanalization. So I think those are just a few cases to share with you to show you the difference of tips and tricks uh, of um, how to do mechanical thrombectomy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Adnan. That was a very nice talk. And I'm sure you have more cases to share with us in the next session. So I'm going to invite Dr. Ansar now, and he's going to show us a live in a box anterior circulation stroke. That's correct. Thank you, Asim. Thank you uh, to the uh, presenters earlier for uh, 
making my job easier. Great cases shown by uh, Asim, Adnan, Atila, other people. Uh, while this is coming on, I know in the audience we have uh, other physicians. We have neurosurgeons, radiologists, neurologists. And when we talk about building collaboration, it's, it's our cardiology doing it. It's not at the exclusion of anyone else doing it. I think it's a partnership. Uh, Dr. Kiani mentioned last night the will and the capacity. And so the capacity is important.